We are very, we are very happy and honored to have uh, today Eftihia, Eftihia Zesta, uh, to to give us this uh, this seminar, this colloquium. Um, so Eftihia is the chief of NASA's Geospace, Geospace Physics Laboratory since 2012, and uh, is an expert in the physical processes underlying the coupling between uh, the Earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere and uh, the impacts of uh, space weather and human activities. Um, her work uh, experience spans uh, the academic environment, civil space, and the Department of Defense. Um, Eftihia has worked on interagency teams and has served uh, on review and advisory committees for NASA, NSF, and the Air Force. And uh, in the past, um, led the NSF-funded SAMBA ground magnetometer array along the coast of uh, Chile and in uh, Antarctica. Her current work uh, uh, focuses on developing min miniaturized instrumentation for CubeSat applications. And uh, she is the PI for the Dion NASA CubeSat mission and the PI of the noise uh, eliminating magnetometer instrument that's a nemesis or, or no, nemesis in a small integrated system. So the brief name is, is nemesis, the abbreviation on the NASA science payload of the Lunar Gateway. And she's also the deputy PI for the nemesis of the space, Geospace Dynamics Constellation mission. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's, uh, we are very delighted to have today FT here and it's a great honor. And now I will uh, pass the floor to Eftihia for, for her talk. Thank you, Eftihia, once more. Thank you, George, and thank you guys for inviting me. It is an honor to be here, to be back with you all and talk to you. And uh, of course, I'm going to speak in English because really, uh, I only know the nomenclature in English, and it would be funny to listen to me try to come up with the right terminology in Greek. But one day I have to do that. So the topic of my talk today is the heating and cooling of the thermosphere during geomagnetic storms, impacts on orbital drag for low Earth orbit space objects, and a little bit about the new dynamics, geospace dynamics constellation mission and the Lunar Gateway. Um, these are uh, folks that have contributed. Kevin Delano is our postdoc, Dan Gershman is um, a civil servant uh, in my lab. He's the PI of one of the instruments on GDC, Danny Oliveira, researcher, Bill Patterson, project scientist for the Hermes Lunar Gateway, Doug Rowland, also at Goddard Space Flight Center. He's the project scientist for the GDC mission. And uh, Mark Moldwin uh, is uh, my colleague from and professor from University of Michigan. Now, a lot of this talk will focus the science part will focus on this upper atmospheric layer of the Earth that you see here, that green hue with the sun behind it that greatly impacts it. I'm going to give you a little bit of background material. If I'm going to here, talk about you, this. Here, could you please yes? change to the presenter's mode? It is in the presenter's mode. Are you not seeing it? No. OK. OK. If there is a problem, that's OK. but. Uh, well, I have switched it to the presenter's mode, but you're not seeing this. You're seeing the regular mode. Yeah, we'll see in the, you know, the layout. Okay. Let, me, let me try to stop sharing. Probably do mirror display and then uh, try again. I'm not sure that that is, uh, let me. Let me share my entire screen, or actually, let me share a window. Um, now, what if I do this? Is this better? No. Yay, nay? No, 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 no we're seeing the same thing anyway. All right. I don't know why it's not. OK. so. Let me try one more thing, and then we'll just continue. I'll just maximize it as much as I can. Mm -hmm. 
is this a little bit better now? Actually, give me a second to close this. How's this? Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, it's the same, right? Yeah, but it, it's it's a okay. little bigger. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Oh, for the love of God. Sorry. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the outer atmosphere. Now, the outer atmosphere is very much dependent on the Earth being within the magnetosphere uh, of, of the Earth and within the space around the Sun. And I have a little movie here uh, that will show you how the whole magnetosphere is impacted. Now, the magnetosphere is the shell of the protective magnetic shell of the Earth. And any activity that comes from the sun that a lot of you know of, and this will simulate uh, a coronal mass ejection, material is ejected, it draws magnetic field lines from the sun, and it impacts the magnetosphere that is shaped like this uh, conical shape, like the teardrop because it's pushed away from the sun. Now it impacts, erodes the magnetosphere, loads a lot of energy, in the magnetotail here, that energy gets processed in the magnetotail and then ultimately it gets dumped at the two high latitudes in the upper atmosphere. Now what that does, eventually it globalizes and the way it gets dumped, it's in two types of energy, kinetic energy, electromagnetic energy. Electromagnetic energy is all the currents and the pointing flux that comes down. And the kinetic energy is all the precipitating particles, electrons, very energetic electrons and ions. What that does after it globalizes, it makes the whole upper atmosphere breathe. Why does it do that? And I'm gonna play this movie to see this breathing out. Once it heats up and it breathes out, so what happens is that in the upper atmosphere between say 80 kilometers and 1000 kilometers, the neutral gas that dominates coexists with the plasma. The plasma is directly electromagnetically connected to the whole magnetosphere. Anything that happens there, it commands that plasma gas in the lower upper atmosphere. That now collides the, the ions of the plasma that have the same mass as the neutrals, through collisions, transfer that whatever energy they're commanded, whatever motion they're commanded to do from the Earth's magnetosphere, it transfers it to the neutrals. That's one way that it transfers a lot of energy to the neutral atmosphere, but another way is by precipitating electrons that come directly through the field lines, those electrons actually ionize and transfer energy. So the whole gas heats up eventually, it globalizes, and I'll show you how it does after the energy gets dropped up there and it goes down. Now, if you notice in this movie, you will see that this side, the left side, is a little bit more bubbled up than the right side. That's because this, this side is the day side. By UV radiation from the sun, it heats up the side of the earth that constantly looks towards the sun, but then that's the constant process and it cools down when it goes in the night side over there. But then when a temporary, a transient change happens by uh, a shock, a storm, then all that energy that goes on the tops here, it globalizes and makes the whole atmosphere globally breathe. Yeah. So... All right, this is going to be difficult. So now what is the impact of that thermosphere heating? Obviously, it is significantly important for any object in low Earth orbit, all the way up to 1,000 kilometers. Here is an example of a satellite in a sort of elliptical orbit, and it starts from this outer orbit, but its perigee, the closest point in the Earth, goes deep inside this upper atmosphere. Now, when that heats up, any satellite at a specific altitude suddenly finds itself in the, in the ambience of more dense material that drags it down. And when a satellite in a biorbital mechanics gets decelerated here, what it means is that its apogee drops down because the semi-major axis uh, of the elliptical orbit 
gets reduced. So the orbit drops, drops, drops until eventually it re-enters. Now, what that does is two things. Number one, objects that we don't want to enter, enter a lot faster, and it's hard to keep them up there. Um, I mean, ask Thodoris of how much um, fuel they have to carry uh, for Daedalus. But the other thing it, it does is that we cannot predict, if we don't know exactly how these variations of density happen, we cannot predict where all these space objects are and things like this can happen. If we don't know exactly where they are, they can collide. And this is one of the most famous collisions that happened about 10 years ago or more. This is the Cosmos, um, old retired um, Russian satellite with one of the Iridium satellites. And this is the amount of debris that you can see that now they have scattered along the prior two orbits of the two satellites. And the green is the pre-existing debris and the red one is the new one. So that is now it's becoming as more and more objects go up in low earth orbit. This is becoming really critical. And the space weather transient impacts, they become very important. And certainly both ESA and all the space fetting societies care about this. So the question we study with our work is how the strength of the storm impacts the upper atmosphere and what are those time scales? Can we look at the whole system at the system level instead of details and predict for our models or provide to our models these time scales of how long it takes to heat up, how long it takes to cool down based on the strength of the storm so we can give this to the models to provide some better predictions. Now, just so you can see, at least in the US, uh, the space weather community and uh, the defense community cares about the one in a hundred year storm. So I have put here two examples of two storms. In these two panels here is an index that we call DST. Essentially, that is an index that gives you the strength of the storm. I'm not gonna go into details how it is derived, but suffice it to say that, say that these two plots are in the X axis, they have days, and the Y axis is the strength of this index in magnetic field strength. And the more negative this index, the more intense the storm. Then you can see here, right here, this huge uh, negative blip and spike that is the strongest storm in our space era ever since we have had objects in space since the 50s this is the strongest storm that we have ever recorded since we've been recording uh storms in space era that one you can see the index went down to minus 500 so the more negative the more stronger the storm now what did this storm do in this panel here what you see in blue is the number of satellites of space objects in 1989 that the tracking radars from DOD, they track all the space objects, the same with all the countries for obvious reasons. And then this yellow is an index of activity in the upper atmosphere. And it, you see it coincides with the storm. So it basically lasted for a couple of days. And the blue is the number of satellites they cannot track. Every radar has a task that they have to track when an object comes within its horizon, they have X amount of time to track these objects. And whether they find them, they check them. If they don't find them, they cannot find them, but they need to. So you can see here how many objects days after the storm they have been lost. And it took close to, to about uh, 15 days to recover those objects. Now, this is the impact that that storm had in 1989 with the number of debris and space objects we had then. Imagine if that same thing would have happened today. It's been a couple of decades that we've had any serious storms. Now, this is exactly on the same scale as that. We're talking about this little blip here of a baby storm. What did that baby storm do? This was in February 2022 actually last year, about a year ago. This is when SpaceX launched 40, uh, 50 Starlink satellites and they lost 39 actually, not 40. I took those from the news, but we've worked with Starlink and SpaceX to study this storm. And the reason why they lost them, they lost 39 of the uh, 50, I think, or 49. And, the, uh, and they recovered about 11 of them. 
The reason is that they launch them at 250 kilometers altitude, which is really low. And normally they bump them up to higher orbit. But this little storm, which they, they had an empirical model of the neutral density, so they couldn't predict what it would do. And they had maneuvers that they were doing that they were not the right maneuvers. So basically they lost those satellites. There is, it's not just the density, but it is also how we were prepared for that. So this was a really weak storm and yet it had an impact. So it made a lot of news. So now what do we have? There is uh, a, a, what we call now casting or specification model that tells you right now within now and the next three hours and the past three hours, what is happening out there? This one is called HASDOM, high accuracy, um, whatever model. Uh, this one is operated in the command for space uh, uh, at uh, US DOD. And that uses an empirical with some physics called JBO8 model at its core. And then it uses tracking of calibration satellites and adjust every three hours, the global density, the three dimensional density. Now we have access to JBO8. We have access to other empirical models like EMSYS and DTM that work all pretty reasonable, but I will show you what their forecast does. Now, why do we want empirical and not physics-based models? If you want, or a satellite like those want to have quick predictions, you can't run a full physics-based model. You need something that will run immediately. And that's what these models do. And it, it needs to be able to predict to you what will happen if, uh, if uh, with the space station needs to be protected. Uh, satellites that are looking down at the earth and they are at 600 or 700 kilometers, are they going to suffer a collision? So you need these fast empirical models, but this kind of has them we don't have access to. So there is a lot of effort by the community to see how we can data simulate a lot of tracking and a lot of observations to get better now casting because our forecasting, which is predicting up to 72 hours in advance, is really very weak during storms. Now here's some physics. Um, you guys, or some of you will be familiar with the Champ and Grace satellites that were primarily done by the ESA and European efforts. Those were satellites that started in the 2000s. These are the best observations we have of the neutral atmosphere, consistent since about 2000. And then those two have been, of course, followed up by Swarm. But I, uh, and those take consistent observations of the neutral density. They are in low Earth orbits. Uh, they look like this, like arrows. This is, this is like a three satellites was grace. Uh, and they look like arrows because I, they're aerodynamically built. You can see their solar panels are all body mounted. Uh, they don't have anything projecting uh, outwards because they need to know their drag coefficient very carefully. How do we use those to measure actual density of the atmosphere? They use accelerometers, very sensitive instruments located at the center of the mass of the satellite that can detect any kind of decelerations or accelerations. And then you use the drag equation. Uh, this alpha here is the drag, and it depends on the mass density of the atmosphere, the drag coefficient of the actual body that moves within the fluid gas. This is um, the cross-sectional area of the spacecraft and it, over its mass. And the V, that velocity, is the relative velocity of the spacecraft with respect to the background wind. Now the winds and the density are the biggest sources of error because if you measure the acceleration, you should be able to deduce the mass. So usually what these satellites do is they assume a wind model that gives you up to a 20% error, but they when they know the, the drag coefficient very accurately, they deduce the mass density. So from these satellites and swarm, we've gotten since 2000 consistently mass density data during storms. And here is one of the bigger storms in 2003. And this is the density through about three days. These are days. And this is the density in kilograms per meter cubed. 
And you can see that all these up and down blips are actually orbits because the density through the orbit changes. So these are expected, but this whole trend of up and down is the impact of the storm and all these huge peaks that you see here, they're all at the high latitudes because that's where the energy gets dumped. And this is the GRACE satellite that was at about, I think, uh, 500 and something kilometers then, and it lost about 70 meters of altitude. Now, 70 meters of altitude for such a large satellite that also has a lot of uh, command and uh, fuel and everything is quite a lot. A CubeSat would have lost hundreds of meters, and I will show you next. So that is a way by which we have measured mass density. Now, what do we do with this? Let me show you what we do. We do a, something that we call superposed epoch analysis. If you have a phenomenon that has a repeated behavior, then you can sort of align um, the properties that you want to study, in this particular case, the density behavior of the upper atmosphere with respect to the onset of that specific event and the duration of that specific event. So the event is geomagnetic storms like CME storms of different strength. And I'm showing you here some basic data of what such a storm would look like. This was again, the same storm that you saw before, 2003 from November. This is that index that shows you the strength of the storm. So I have two vertical lines here. The first index is when a shock in front of the CME impacts, a hypersonic shock. And then you start this, uh, the driving of the magnetosphere begins right here when that index starts going negative. And what I've plotted here is the density as observed by the CHAMP satellite. This is, we're talking about uh, two days of data here. And in this plot here, so this is the time series of the density, and you can see the impact of the storm, how the density rises and goes down with the strength of the storm that is shown by that index. And right here, what I've plotted is in latitude, the actual orbit of the satellite, because the orbit of the satellite is a high inclination. It goes to almost 90 degrees or 80 something degrees and back down. So you can see the orbit going up and down, up and down, up and down. And the color along the orbit in time is the density. So you can see that from here, uh, you have the first indication that something is happening. You can see the color changes from blue to red at the high latitudes. This is the Northern polar cap. This is the Southern polar cap. And then after a while, the storm takes over and you can see that this, it becomes red at all latitudes. That is the energy globalizing. So what we've done, we took 217 storms of different strengths of DSD with this repeated pattern. And we actually, um, uh, we put them, we bend them all together by time and latitude. We ignored the local time because the local time matters too, but we needed to have enough data and we actually bend them in latitude. And then we took the density change with respect to what it was before. So when you look at this plot, this is the superposed epoch analysis of all the storms. You can see a system level behavior of the density in color. This is the latitude for plus 90 to minus 90. We go 12 hours before the storm. Zero, star, zero is the epoch zero time of beginning of the storm. And we go in this plot 60 hours after. So what you can see is that where the color changes from blue how it progresses, how strong it gets, and when does it recover to go back to the color that it was before. And the two typical things that you see is that it first starts at the two high latitudes. It takes some time to globalize. You can see that it moves equatorward, what we call the density enhancement or heating, this bubbling up of the upper atmosphere. It stays strong and then it slowly recovers. And by 60 hours, it still has not quite gotten the color of before. Now, what happens if we 
split these storms and, and with different intensity. So these are all the intensities. Don't worry too much about it. Just think that we split them into weak, moderate, strong, and severe, and extreme. Now extreme is what our field characterizes as maybe the one in a hundred years, the ones we should really worry about. So I have stacked those plots in exactly the same way. They're superposed epoch analysis, but now I split them up by strength. And you can see the difference. The things that you want to see, this vertical dashed line is always the zero epoch time. You look at the color before and you look where it started, always at the high latitudes, but you see as you move to stronger and stronger storms, more area is affected. It, it starts immediately at more higher latitudes and goes more to mid latitudes. And then it takes faster to globalize. You see here, it takes about four hours to reach the equator, the heating, but here it only takes about an hour and a half. And then what you see, they're all plotted in color in exactly the same scale. So you can see the difference by storm. And then the other thing that is very obvious is that in these kind of moderate storms, uh, 60 hours after we still have not quite recovered to the previous color. And as we're moving to stronger and stronger, the time it takes to recover gets shorter and shorter. So we put all this together. And if you have any questions, do ask me. And we managed to put it together in this plot, which is the prediction we have to offer. This is from actual observations. So here I'm plotting time in hours and the intensity of the storm. And the points are the categories of the storms we have collected. The red line is that how long does it take from the zero epoch time until we reach maximum in the density? And then the blue line is how long does it take from the onset of the storm until the storm has recovered to the pre-storm density, almost to 25% of it. And what you see is these are weaker storms and these are stronger storms. The, uh, what we call it is the more it heats up, the faster it cools. This is where we have more heating you can see how much faster it, the atmosphere cools down. It only takes less than a day to recover from a fast, uh, from a very extreme storm. Now, mind you, we only had seven events here. So we're really after getting that up by going back in time. And that's a different discussion. But this is something that the models cannot predict. They cannot predict this time. They cannot predict this time of the storms. So what does that mean? Now, why does that happen? A little bit of time, and I'm going to go quickly through that. Why, if you have more heating in the upper atmosphere, it cools so fast? And the answer is the nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is a fundamental topic of the upper uh, constituent of the upper atmosphere. And what happens is that it creates it, but it matters for cooling. So when you get a lot of energy coming in, N2 and O2 atoms, they break apart. Also, they break apart by UV radiation, but they certainly break apart by heating. And then they find each other. They need electrons to come down and break those bonds, and they need heat to connect together and create nitric oxide. When nitric oxide gets created, and there is about five different paths by which this can be created, but the main constituent for nitric oxide to be created is to have heat because it's an endothermic reaction and to have a lot of energetic electrons to basically destroy or break apart those bonds and excite those nitric oxide atoms in an excite, bring them up in an excited state and then they radiate out that heat. So just to show you, we did this analysis. So the nitric oxide has been called the thermostat of the, the atmosphere. This is the timed mission. The timed mission has this instrument called SABER, the sounding of the atmosphere using broadband emission radiometry. And it looks in radio frequencies. 
and it's a remote sensing instrument. It looks out in the limb as the satellite is moving. This instrument is looking out in the limb. And by looking at all these different radio frequencies, it does an altitudinal scan at some distance far away, as far away as the altitude allows in a limp looking measurement. So basically every couple of seconds, it gets an altitudinal distribution. And this particular one that I'm showing you is nitric oxide emissions. So if you look at one of those, this one is the intensity of the emissions in the x-axis, and the y-axis is the altitude that goes from 40 kilometers to 160 kilometers. I'm showing you the emissions before the storm. So again, these scans, they keep getting it every couple of seconds as the satellite moves and it crosses the high latitudes and everything. So basically right here, you can see this peak. There is a very large peak that is created by tropospheric and mesospheric processes down here below 60 kilometers and even 40 kilometers. But I'm gonna focus at the behavior above 100 kilometers. This is before the storm. This is what happens after the storm we're talking about tripling and quadrupling of the nitric oxide. Now, we took that and we put it together in the same way that I've been showing you in this superposed epoch analysis. And this is what these plots look like. The two plots, top plots here is the nitric oxide. The bottom plots are again, the density from Champ and Grace. We have a subset of moderate storms here and severe storms on the right hand side to see the different behavior. And the reason why we only have moderate and severe is because we want to overlap with the timed mission. So those are the events that we started. So the superposed and epoch analysis, the density here goes up. And then you can see that the nitric oxide generation, this intense color, happens at the higher latitudes. And then it goes on for the more severe storms. You can see that it starts immediately after the zero line. Here it takes some time. And we studied all these delays. Here it starts immediately. It peaks the more intensity, the more heating you put into the high latitudes, the more nitric oxide generates. And it almost works like a switch. This one switches off and it kind of the atmosphere, the density here goes back to the previous color. So the more intense storms generate more nitric oxide and they turn off the heating of the mass density faster. I'm not gonna go through that because I want to actually summarize uh, the orbital drag effect so I can talk to you about the mission. This says exactly what I have told you that the more severe storms operate, uh, generate nitric oxide faster. Impacts on orbital drag. Now this is what we worry about. What I'm showing you here again, superposed epoch analysis plots for the extreme storms. Now, what I'm having on the top is our actual observations. These are 12 hours before the storm, 72 hours after the storm. But here now at the middle is the forecasting model, JB08. If I input all the inputs, the DST and the other parameters that this model needs to run for these specific seven storms, can I reproduce the same behavior? So you can see that this model does not get the heating at the high latitudes, does not get the globalization the propagation to equatorial latitudes, and it doesn't get the cooling right. Here, we still have intense density when the actual atmosphere has recovered. Now, what this bottom is, is the HASDEM. This is this model with data simulation, essentially, with a lot of data ingested in it. So you can see how well this one reproduces the actual observations in terms of time scales. So this is what we're looking for. The point of this plot is to demonstrate to you that we need to be, this is an error region. We want to be, this is the percentage error of the density we want to tolerate. We want to tolerate plus or minus 5% of error. This is the hours before and after the storm. We want to be in this gray area, but you can see that 
our forecast model, the best one that we have right now, or one of the best, is way off at the heating of the storm and at the recovery of the storm, the cooling. So what does, what does that do? This is what that does. What these plots show is in-track error of a sample satellite when it goes through one storm. This is one storm of August 24, 2005. So what you're getting here is X, Y, and Z in the orientation in the uh, centric, uh, geocentric system. And it's in kilometers. It tells you, if I, if I was tracking this satellite and I was following it, how far off the path where I was looking for it, it would be. This one is the error by the HASDA model, the one that has data simulation. So this is what we call now casting, the one that keeps ingesting data. This one is pure forecast. So after four hours, where have we reached in terms of in-track error? We're almost at 10 kilometers. This one is at about five kilometers. Now, the biggest difference is after 72 hours, after the storm has gone and passed. The HASDA model maintains and contains the in-track error to under 20 kilometers, about 15. But this one, our forecast, has bubbled to over 100 kilometers. That means we've lost that satellite. We can no longer track it. And this is why we care so much about predicting the right density. So. I have a summary here that the severe and extreme storms show simultaneous heating. I'm repeating all the things that I told you. I want, we're focusing on extreme and severe storms because those have most of the errors and those are the ones that can be most dangerous. But as you have seen from the Starling, SpaceX Starling example, depending on how you operate in space, even weak storms can really make an impact. We really do not understand the system level times of heating and cooling of the whole thermosphere, but we do have enough data now to draw some basic, uh, uh, basic uh, um, conclusions and put those times down and have our modelers try to reach those times. And one important parameter when we try to understand the physics, that's for the physics-based model and the empirical. We need to put the nitric oxide radiative cooling, uh, radiative emissions and, uh, and, uh, and um, dynamics inside our models, or we're not going to get our forecast right 72 hours in, a, in advance. So we have uh, conned the phrase of the hotter it gets, the faster it cools. And that uh, nitric oxide above 100 kilometers plays a very important role in the thermospheric thermal balance and impacts, impacts orbital drag. Now, here I want to close this uh, physics section, more of the science section, and I'm going to go talk um, about uh, the two missions. But I wanted to take some questions if you have them now or if you want to wait at the end. Maybe wait in the, till the end. OK. So the Geospace Dynamics Constellation, GDC. Now, GDC is a constellation mission, a constellation of six satellites that is exactly aimed to study the physics of the upper atmosphere. I have taken these slides by the project scientist, Doug Rowland. So I'm using those with his permission. And you can see here uh, the typical image that is in front of all of the mission documents. You can see that the six satellites in this particular configuration. So this mission was awarded, um, it, it, it got its first uh, three instruments last year and the last two instruments were just selected last month, January 5, the selection came out. And um, so now it has five instruments and that's what it looks like. So it is aimed with this constellation for three years with main mission. And obviously, there will be some extended mission. It's going to launch around 2029, or maybe there might be later. But right now, that's the 2029 is the launch. And it's going to study all these processes of the upper atmosphere. It's going to have high inclination satellite orbits. The satellites will come together from close to apart. 
but the instruments are um, the CAPE instrument. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. This is by Dan Gershman as PI and Maria Samara as a deputy PI. This is uh, in our lab. Uh, I'm the instrument scientist for that instrument. We also have the magnetometer that the CAPE instrument measures precipitating ions and electrons and I'm going electrons. Uh, there is the Nemesis, uh, which is the magnetometer system of distributed sensors with Mark Moldwin from University of Michigan as the PI and myself as the deputy PI. There is Mosaic. Mosaic measures uh, all neutral and ion species and composition and winds and drifts. Uh, it's from uh, Medi Bena from University of Maryland, Baltimore County. That is the TPS, the thermal plasma sensor. Uh, the PI is Phil Anderson from University of Texas in Dallas. It will measure the thermal uh, plasma um, drifts and uh, temperature and uh, um, basic composition of ions in the upper atmosphere. And there's Lila Anderson with the ether instrument that will measure, it's kind of like a very fancy um, Langmuir probe, but it has short booms and will study essentially the thermal plasma in high frequency with a lot of capability. This is the, the I think the same kind of instrument is on the MAVEN Mars satellite. So this is currently the team. There is uh, uh, several teams selected, three teams selected as the interdisciplinary scientists, which are the leaders in the science, five uh, instruments and the project scientists. So this team now, this mission is on full blast and keep going. I'm gonna show you now what the orbits look like through the three years. These orbits are gonna start by being really, really close and then they're gonna spread around. They're gonna go through four phases and here you will see how the orbits shape, but they will actually be configurations of the satellites in phase of the orbit where they create different triangles and shapes so that you can do spatial um, structure of, uh, spe spatial analysis of structures in the upper atmosphere. So this one right now is in phase one. This is phase 1b. You can see the satellites keep spreading. Here we're looking at from the top down from the northern polar cap. This one is from the equator from the side. You can see day side, night side. The inclination is 83 degrees. So you can see the maximum, the peak of where the orbits cross is precessing around. <coughs> and phase 3a, the satellites have spread, but you can see they keep pairs of orbits closer to each other, and then they spread the pairs. And this is phase four that globally it is covered. This is it, almost done. I have a lot more movies like those if people are interested. And it will not move. Okay, so now I want to talk about a couple of slides on the CAPE instrument because those are the two instruments that my lab has on the GDC. So the comprehensive aurora precipitation experiment, high level, Dan Gershman from 673 is the PI. Uh, this is a team, Maria Samara, the deputy PI. I'm the instrument scientist, meaning I'm leading the science of the instrument. This is our instrument team. It's a collaboration with Southwest Research Institute, Applied Physics Laboratory, and other institutions. And this is the team that has actually done the fast plasma instrument on the MMS. So they carry all that from the MMS mission, the multi-scale magnetospheric mission, to the GDC mission and the knowledge of how to build those spectrometers. Now, in terms of the science, this is the main uh, science. What CAPE is going to study? We're gonna look at downgoing electrons. So this is the aurora. What makes the aurora? This is one of the two energy inputs. I told you very early on, that when there is this transient events, other than the constant heating by UV radiation on the day side, that there is this transient events 
and all of the energy from the transient events gets dumped into the high latitudes. It gets dumped in two forms. It gets dumped as electromagnetic energy, which you will see next from the magnetometer, and it gets dumped as particle precipitation. This instrument is looking at that form of energy. So we're looking at downgoing electrons. The energy is up to about, uh, the electrons go from 10 EV to 30 kV. This is the typical aurora precipitation. But what happens, uh, particularly at the low energies, when electrons come down in the atmosphere, they generate so many secondary. They, they generate photo by photoionization. They generate by scattering and throwing electrons up. So a whole slew of electron population now keeps flowing upwards. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo. Somebody has a hot mic? Okay. So when we study these upward electrons, particularly in low energies, they tell us something about the atmosphere below. And we have inversion codes and kinetic codes that will try to de uh, determine what is happening below. And also at the higher energies, they tell you what the total resulting energy is. So secondary electrons and reflecting electrons can be separated by energy. We will also look at the downgoing ions. Ions are much more energetic. They go deeper, in, deeper into, the into the atmosphere, and they're particularly focused on one side, the dusk side of the magnetosphere, particularly during storms, and they can totally change the dynamics of winds and everything there. So um, we are quantifying both of those properties. Now, this is what the instrument, this is a sort of big view of what the instrument would look like. So the instrument has two optics heads. Uh, it's an electrostatic analyzer. They're identical on the two sides. The electronics are in between, but essentially the electrons need to look at 360 degrees. That's why they need to hang out of the spacecraft on the side so that they have this 360 degrees field of view for electrons to do both the downgoing and the direction by which the electrons are coming matters and the upgoing. And then this, even though it's identical to that, it's mounted uh, on the top of the body of the spacecraft. So it has a 180 degree view, meaning it's looking upwards and catching all of the ions that are coming down. So this is what this tells you, what's the, the, the basic orientation and mounting of the instrument. Now, quickly, let me go to the next instrument, that's Nemesis, near-Earth magnetometer instrument in a small integrated system. And essentially, we're looking at the electromagnetic energy input at high latitudes. What this figure is showing you is a view looking down at the polar cap, and these arrows up and down are field-aligned currents that the magnetometer as it's crossing through can measure all of this. It's a standard technique that it has been measured. So this is our goals to understand the large scale, regional and local electrodynamical energy input and the pathways by which that energy. So you can see that with these two instruments, we cover the energy inputs to the upper atmosphere. Now, finally, uh, we're two minutes over, but we started late. Let me show you what the, <coughs> the instrument concept for Nemesis is. It comes from a line of miniaturizations. So the concept is this satellite GDC is going to have a short boom. Magnetometers are sensitive to all magnetic fields. They cannot say that is a magnetic field that I want to measure and that one is one I cannot measure. They measure all. So if you have a short boom, normally they go into long booms to separate them from the noise of a spacecraft. The spacecraft has a lot of magnetic noise. They may have magnets for torquers. They may be instruments, high currents flowing, batteries, reaction wheels. All those things will make signatures on the magnetometer. So our specialty with Mark Moldwin from Michigan, and something we've been working on for the past many years, is to use multi sensors, many sensors spread around. The concept being that if you have a geophysical source of magnetic field, 
all of your sensors, however many, in this case three, they should measure the same response to that geophysical signal. But if you have local noises, noise sources of magnetic field like reaction wheels, by spreading them in different locations, that noise will drop off as one over R cubed. So it will be different. So by inverting this, we're able to clean any bus noise and actually get you. So we have one little board. That board is um, under eight centimeters by eight centimeters. This is our flux gate, which is the high um, sensitivity magnetometer. It's 22 by 22 by 32 millimeters. It's all miniaturized and it's at the end of a boom. And we have these two purchased uh, off the shelf P uh, magneto inductive magnetometers that University of Michigan specializes into selecting and testing and selecting the best and packaging them like this. You can see the size of those is slightly bigger is about three by five cent or three by four centimeters. And those we place somewhere in the bus, in the satellite to detect sources of noise. And then we do algorithms that uh, University of Michigan published recently to clean up the noise. And that's what we've done two minutes on the lunar gateway. This figure that I showed you about the configuration of Nemesis is from gateways, what we're actually currently building to deliver for the lunar gateway. And the lunar gateway will be the base, essentially the space station around the moon. Uh, the very first to launch in 2025 is the first two modules. And you see them here is the PPE, the power and propulsion element with a huge 20 meter, the solar panels are uh, over 20 meter each one. There is the halo module, the habitation, logistic and logistics outpost. And there's actually a whole bunch of platforms on it that in this figure look like little babies. One is down here, another one is up there. Uh, the one that um, from uh, NASA is the Hermes, the Heliophysics Environmental and Radiation Measurement Experiment Suite that has four science instruments. There is an ESA called ERSA that is actually on this module over here. And there is another platform that was added more recently than the other two. It's called IDA. It's a collaboration of ESA and JAXA, JAXA being the Japanese Space Agency. So all of these, we collaborate and we each build our own set of science instruments to actually try to get radiation and um, in this difficult environment. Uh, the orbit is going to be an orbit around the moon. It's going to be a halo orbit around the moon. And in particular, it's going to be a halo uh, southern rectilinear orbit, meaning that as the moon, so this is the elliptical plane. This is the sun orientation in the X GSE direction. This is the Y. So that's the elliptical plane. This is the orbit of the moon, essentially. So this is one year of the orbit of the um, gateway that I have plotted here. And you can see it goes into the magneto tail, into the magneto sheath. And most of the time, out of the 29s of the moon's orbit, it spends four to six days in the magneto tail three to four days in the magneto sheet and the rest 19 to 22 days within the solar wind. So a lot of solar wind science. There is already two Themis of the Themis spacecraft called now Artemis that are in equatorial orbit around the moon there. And Gateway is gonna be in a polar orbit around the moon. And when I plot it into the vertical plane, so this is the Z direction, this is again the X direction going up and down, but now this is the meridional plane perpendicular to the elliptical. You can see what the orbit looks like. So we're gonna sample a lot of the southern lobes of the magneto tail. And this is, uh, this is my last slide. This is what, actually I have one more. This is what the platform Hermes looks like. It has four instruments. It has the Nemesis, although here we, the acronym calls something else. And again, this is the layout of the Nemesis. It's our electronics box. It's a flux gate magnetometer that is in the most far apart place we can get it. It's gonna be sitting on a stanchion up there. And the two PNIs, one PNI is right here. It's mounted, body mounted there. And if you turn the platform on the other side, there is the second one. 
There is the EEA, which is also with Dan Gershman and Marilia Samara. They're the same team that are doing CAPE. You can see a, a repeated pattern here. This is electron spectrometer. SPAN-I is by University of Berkeley. It's an ion mass spectrometer. Oops. And there is uh, MERIT that is right here that is energetic electrons and ions. So very energetic ones, MEV ions. And uh, the other two platforms are gonna measure a lot of these energetic particles. There is a lot of interest in that by ESA and JAXA. So finally, just to give you a little preview, my very final slide of what this noise cancellation technique looks like. So let's focus on this one. I know you cannot see the uh, axis or anything. So this is about a few minutes of data from the interplanetary magnetic field. The scale here is 10 nanoteslas to 10 nanoteslas. So this is interplanetary magnetic field um, at the near the orbit of the moon. It's from the Artemis data. And the orange line that you see here is the actual data measure there. So it's good data. But what Mark uh, and his student Alex have done is they added a whole bunch of noise. So this is the actual field. The scale is about five minus five nanotesla. Now they've added a whole bunch of noise. And then they pretend that our nemesis, our two PNIs and the one flux gate at the locations on the Hermes platform are measuring this orange line signal plus the whole bunch of noise, things turning off, turning on, uh, random noise coming in throughout this period of a few minutes. So you can see if you add all this noise, what the three magnetometers will observe. It looks, looks nothing like this, right? But then underneath this, after they've done the reconstruction, you can see a blue line peeking out. And at some points like here, it gets it wrong, but mostly it gets it really right. So this is what this noise cancellation technique will do. This is what we're gonna do at Hermes, and this is what we're gonna do at GDC as well. This is my last slide and I'm gonna take questions. Okay, Eftihia, thanks a lot. That was wonderful, a lot of information. I think it would be nice that we will have this uh, you know, the YouTube channel of uh, Lasset and that uh, would give us the opportunity to review these uh, slides and maybe come, come up with more questions in the future. But now, of course, the floor is open to our colleagues for questions. I think they yeah. are happy with your talk. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was uh, very nice seeing you after many, many years. I think I was a student in Thessaloniki last time. I had, uh, I had really? seen it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm probably the least uh, knowledgeable on all the interesting things that you presented here, but I was just a bit curious. Uh, the, you know, you, you mentioned sort of like the effects of uh, uh, of the puffing in a sense of the upper atmosphere when you have, uh, when the temperature rises, right? I was a bit, uh, and I, I had heard also about this event where, the, where the several satellites were uh, lost just because of that. But typically, out of curiosity, how much does the, uh, you may have heard it in the slides and I didn't see it, but how much does the density change? Because low Earth satellite, low Earth orbit. Oh, yes, are, very good question. Sort of like in the order of, isn't it like 240, 250 kilometers? So does it change so, that, so dramatically? Yeah. Uh, just you, from the energy injection that uh, you will. So you will. You, you steal my question, though. Uh, sorry, Tassos. So let me see if my um, yeah, my no slide here this shows it. Uh, this one, okay. Uh, this is a density. Okay. So what I'm plotting right here, can you guys see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one is the density during the storm, calibrated by quiet density. 
So it changes by a factor of maybe at the peak, an order of magnitude, by a factor of six, four, eight mm -hmm. during the peaks. So it essentially quadruples or six times that and can go as much as an order of magnitude depending on the altitude. So the most dramatic change with respect to that happen at higher altitudes. But there, it can change by more than an order of magnitude. It's not as impactful because there isn't that much material. So if you had three molecules and you made them six, it's not mm -hmm. going to do that much, even though the relative change is huge. But when you go lower down to around, the, the critical region is between 300 and 500. Anything below 400 is in danger. Anything below 450. But there, the 400 to 500, you will have thousands. So when you suddenly go from thousands in a small area, uh, to, so this one is 10 to the minus, typical density values are 10 to the minus 12 mass density. So this is mass density, kilograms per meter cubed. So you need to decide what the constituents are to decide how many particles you have there, what they are, what's going to hit. But think about that. Very high density is 10 to the minus 10 kilograms per meter cubed. Uh, and typically in very quiet times, you will be measuring 10 to the minus 13 kilograms per meter cubed. But, so, yes. But there, you may, and I presume that the drag goes with density squared, right? It's not no. linear. The drag goes proportional <laughs> to density. It goes with velocity square. A velocity so this square. is the so, the drag coefficient. Yeah. So so but oh. the thing but the thing is that you know naively I would say you have a satellite that uh, goes around. You goes around in with a with a period which is in the order of an hour, right? Right. Ninety so, minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So ninety minutes. Right. So it does, uh, and you and you have it there for years. Right. So, and over this period of a year, it will have done uh, so, something like uh, 20 times 300. There are about uh, 15 5, orbits per day. There are yeah, about 15, 15 orbits, orbits per day. So, you, it will have done something like, say, 5,000, uh, several thousand orbits per year. Mm -hmm. Correct. This, and, and it experiences a drag all this period. Right. Yes. So why does the, so? I would imagine that the additive effects of the drag would be similar over a year with the effect of the drag that you will have uh, uh, during. Uh... Excellent question. Yeah. Excellent question, and I'll tell you why it is excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I pass. Number one. Well, I'm, I'm pissed. <laughs> you know, me Your question I is continue. excellent. I started okay. annoying you in the what? morning and I continue in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> no, what you're asking is very critical and it's something we've argued with. Okay. So, what you're saying, and you're absolutely correct, if I take all these little drags that I experience in time period or in location and I add them all up, it should be the same no matter what. And in principle, you're absolutely correct. If we didn't care about losing satellites. So think about it. If you think of the impacts, yeah, I may be able to constantly have, say I isolate an object, object and you know that they're tracking objects higher than five centimeters. So imagine an object, a debris from cosmos or from iridium that is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And they have to track that. But suddenly a storm happened and they don't know where that is for 10 days. Mm -hmm. Now, what if a whole bunch of those are close to another satellite? So our dynamics group that is monitoring the operations of all these earth observing satellites they observe anomalies by drag all the time they get in the space station they get warnings about debris all the time mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's not that the additive effect 
It's the fact that there is periods of times where you completely lose it and you don't know where it is. So you cannot predict how to protect your other objects. And the more space objects you put there, the worse it is. So yeah, there is another yeah, impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we good. care about, oh, there is other things. Let me just tell you other things that are very important. You care about controlled re-entry. All satellites now, if you're going to launch anything, the CubeSats that Sodoris is launching, you need to have a re-entry plan. But your re-entry plan that they have to calculate when it's going to re-enter and over where if the object is larger goes out of the window the moment a storm comes in. There is another effect. You have localized structure. And we did this calculation. And I have the data to show you if you want. Imagine that you have a satellite in Leo that is going through dawn dusk, dawn dusk, but suddenly you have a substorm and it heated up the night side temporarily, and then another substorm came. So your satellite that is going dawn dusk has never crossed for this few minutes that you're going through this high density region, never crossed it because it's not in its path. But another side is satellite is noon midnight and it's crossing that region. That one is going to add up to a few kilometers of in-track error. So that's what GDC wants to do. Did you see this configuration of orbits? They want to study the impact of localized structure because in the short term, it matters. In the long term, you're absolutely correct. And you know what they did? All of these predictions by DOD, they used to take orbit average densities, orbit average. And they said, we're good. Our error is within 5%. Yeah. Once you move away from orbit average and you go point by point to predict, you're way out. And then they were wondering why they keep losing satellites from their tracking. OK, thank you very much. Very yeah, good question. So, so, so that did another question, though? Yeah, go for it. OK. So first, first a comment. If you are a Chinese space agency, you don't care about re-entry. We have seen that. You don't have re-entry plans. No problem. That's right, you don't. So it, 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 it's a decision that we have to make. Either we care or we don't care. That's a comment. The, the point I want to, to, to ask is, is in this... Uh, Drug coefficient, anyway. You, you have no the, the the drug relation. So we have two measurable things there: the mass density and the velocity. Mm -hmm. how, how you infer the solar wind velocity? You have measurable. It's not the solar well. wind velocity. So yeah. that velocity that's that's another good question, Tasso. And you pointed uh, to something that I didn't talk about, but I need to talk about since you asked me. So yeah. the drag equation, uh, the acceleration and deceleration depends on the mass density. Okay. We talked about that a lot. It depends on the orientation of your satellite. So that's part of what brought the Starlink satellites down. Mm -hmm. They were kept orienting themselves in a way that they presented a huge amount of area to the drag, to the RAM direction. So as uh, the mass, big. the bigger the mass, the yeah. less drag you you suffer. But say that you have a, a fixed object. So this is no. Now that velocity is the relative velocity of your spacecraft. That's the V spacecraft mm -hmm. with respect to the background wind. And this is real wind of the neutral atmosphere at the thermospheric altitudes where the, the temperature now rises again in the atmosphere quite a lot, there are wind patterns that some of it is guided by mesospheric winds and a lot of it is guided by internal processes. And then when a storm happens, those wind patterns get altered by the storm magnetospheric dynamics. Yeah. So, so this so is something we don't know. Yeah, so, so there are no real measurements of the, this uh, wind velocity. So You're absolutely I, correct. There are. So, so you are using you are using um, a model. 
a model, a, an empirical correct. model. Uh, correct. Probably. And well. that's, yeah, you're that absolutely is, correct. Th that this that is, is another power, error. This is, yeah, this is to the power of two, though. This is a very, this is very to huge. The, yes. However, they have calculated the error to be about maximum 25%. So now you have to assume that they've done that right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's people that have done the research and they have figured out that the change in the wind from the empirical model can only be up to that statistically. So then they squared it and they calculated that the error in the mass density, all the mass densities that I've been showing you could potentially have a 20 up to a 20% error that is due to not knowing the wind properly. And this is what GDC will do. GDC will actually be measuring the winds. Good. Very so, good point. And, and, and another question though. In the pantheon. Yeah, okay. And in the George, pantheon. George. Okay, so so an, another question is, okay, about, about the density, okay, about the the, uh, the velocity and all this kind of things. What about the, the, the actual energy? You you know, um, because you are talking about, about hitting the whole uh, thermosphere. What about the energetic particles that you're going to have? What's the effect on that? The effect on the energetic particles? No, what the effect of the energetic particles to ah. the drug problem? So this is uh, this they contribute to the heating. So the energetic particles, and that's a whole different side of research. Mm -hmm. That um, you, if you're talking about the energies that the CAPE instrument will measure, yeah. up to in the electrons will go up to 30 kV, in the ions we're pushing to go to up to 50 kV. So we can grab some ring current. Now it depends where they deposit their energy. So the very energetic particles make it way down and they deposit their energy in the mesosphere. And there is a whole body of research now to see how the chemistry of the atmosphere could change by the very energetic particles coming in. But at the aurora latitudes that we're talking about, so those electrons and the energetic particles, they do many things. So the electrons, for example, before they deposit their energy, just take an electron of 2 kV, okay? That electron, before they, it goes down to 150 kilometers where it eventually will be lost, will hit multiple, hundreds of ions or neutrals. So one electron can suddenly ionize a whole bunch of your neutrals. So now you have a much higher density there and a much higher, because mechanically, the things that rub against each other to transfer energy are the ions and the neutrals. Yeah. So now you're creating with the electrons a whole bunch of ions. So you increase the friction, you increase the mechanical transfer. Mm -hmm. okay. And there is chemistry that goes on. Those electrons are needed for a lot of this recombination, dissociation, and all these kind of processes. So they mess up with the chemistry of the upper atmosphere real big. Good. Okay, I think there's another question by Thodoris. Thodoris. Yes, after here, a fantastic talk. Thank you. And I, I, I've heard about the uh, the study that you did with uh, Oliveira, but uh, and to see it firsthand, and it's, it was amazing. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about since we are at the, on this equation on, on on this slide, we discussed density and velocity. How about the drag coefficient itself? Yes, uh -huh. it always to and be there is the man constant. that knows what he's talking yes, about. <laughs> to be constant and to be dependent on the spacecraft size. But that uh, involves a whole bunch of gas surface interactions. Exactly. So what's the accuracy exactly. on that? What's your, yeah. Could you comment? My on? take is I have no clue and most people don't. So what Fodoris is talking about, he's, you're absolutely correct. So the drag coefficient is another source of error. So since we are in that, the drag coefficient, if you talk to people, it goes from zero to two. That's what they tell you. Yeah. Two zero to two. two. Yeah. It's okay. 
And the higher the drug coefficient, the more drug. But the drug coefficient is determined by hydrodynamic models where you fly the surfaces. So what the surface is made of matters. What the material, the fluid around the surface is made of matters. For example, and so you, 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 you hit on a thing, on a study that we're doing now for op operations to research grant. Okay. The fundamental thing is, if you're typically at the LEO altitudes, you are expecting an oxygen-rich atmosphere. At that altitude of most LEO satellites, you're expecting oxygen because you have hydrogen and then the scale height changes, you move into oxygen. At that altitude, 400 kilometers to 500, most of the molecular species have dissociated into atomic species. So you no longer have much molecular species. So you're building your drug coefficient out of primarily oxygen. And then when you go further out, you have helium. Helium now dominates if you are at 600, 700, and then you go even outer, now hydrogen dominates and you have the exosphere. Now where this transition between oxygen and helium happens, guess what? Once you get a storm, that transition moves down in altitude. And suddenly, suddenly all the, and NASA cares about that because all earth observing satellites and ESA, they are at 600, 700 kilometers, which means they are in a helium dense atmosphere. The drug coefficient is completely different. So variable we, drug coefficient, uh, <laughs> altitude dependent and species dependent. Exactly. Drug coefficient. The same satellite, the yeah. same body with the same mass, the same surface during a storm could change its drug okay. coefficient. How much? Nobody knows. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. We don't know. Very this good point. Was, Excellent. This is uh, this is uh, uh, another reason to justify a low dipping mission. Exactly. Diving we need it deeper. We need it. Absolutely. Thank Excellent you. questions, you guys. You unraveled all of my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I'm sure that you have a few more, but. Yeah, it's good discussion. Good discussion. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, <clears throat> I think at this point we may need to finish to end the, this wonderful session. I mean, uh, thanks a lot, Eftihia, for thank you, Eftihia, for giving us this. Thank uh, you, guys. The pleasure to talk. talk. Thank you very much. And wake up early in the morning to deliver it's all this material. Normal thing. All this material to us. Okay. So thank you. I mean, the video will be available afterwards in the YouTube channel of uh, the Hellenic uh, of Hellas. <clears throat> right. Okay. So.